Hello, I am Marie King. I am the general manager and beverage director here at the Tonga Hut, which is LA's oldest tiki bar. We've been open since 1958, and I've been running the show since 2012. I got my start in 2010, opening the first new Dawn the Beachcomber to open in 33 years down in Huntington Beach. So I created their original menu and I was their first bar manager down there. Did that for a couple of years, had a car accident, laid me up for two years and I came here in 2012. The layout and the bar as you see it today is exactly as it was in 1958 when we opened. So the Tonga Hut opened in 1958 by two brothers, Ace and Edwin Libby. They worked together at a place in Van Nuys called the Samoa House and just really wanted to work for themselves and go into business for themselves. The couple of things that we changed in 2011, we redid this front area, took out the booth that was along the back there. We put in the fireplace, but it is era specific. And everything, sans a couple of things which are seamless, is exactly the way the architect designed it. The architect walked in here with a stick, piece of chalk at the end of the stick, and drew the lines as you see them today. So booth, 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 fountain, bathroom, office, bar, the lines on the bar. It's exactly as the architect designed it in 58. And they just built from those chalk lines. Our piece de resistance, I think, is Big Mo over here. He was carved in 1958. I would love to know who carved it. I've tried to research it, haven't found out yet. Ace really, really lived the lifestyle. He had a tiki room at home. We know this because there was one of his granddaughters read about the Tonga Hut in their 60th anniversary, I think, in one of the newspapers, and she was completely blown away that it was still here. One of the granddaughters came in and told us that Ace and his wife had almost the exact same fireplace in their family room, so they really did live it. The piece on the back wall there, the map of Polynesia, was done by Kirby. He also did our logo for us back in 2006 or 2007, so he's been our local artist. He did the carving on the doors. Ace passed away in 97. Edwin was 20 years older than Ace, so he died pretty early on after they opened this place. After Edwin passed away, he took on a partner, Daryl. So he left it to Daryl. Daryl had it for a few more years. He was this little, tiny, tiny, short little guy. Daryl left it to his girlfriend, Mary, when he passed away. Mary sold it to one gentleman who had it for about a year and a half. And then in 2005, Jeremy Fleener bought it. And Jeremy and Kevin and Claudia Murphy now own the, the franchise. I've heard two stories from people about coming in here in the 90s, I guess. Shag came in once and he recalls the bartender being this little short guy, so it had to have been Daryl. And he ordered a zombie. And Daryl looked at him, looked at him, looked at him and was like, yeah, I think I got the stuff to make that. Went in the back, it spent about two minutes in the back, and he had a book of the recipes and had to gather the ingredients that came out, but Josh said it was pretty decent zombie. Like a 1950s passion fruit, but balanced and fresh juices and well-made zombie. So he was kind of impressed. But on the other side of that scale, Jeff Beach Bumberry came in. It probably this was more like the 80s because he said the bartender was wearing a Guns N' Roses t-shirt that she had fringed on the bottom and ordered a Mai Tai. She says, yeah, I can make it, what's in it? <laughs> so he said, you know, this rum, some orja, juice of one lime. So she grabbed a pint glass and a blender, started pouring stuff in the blender, threw the entire lime in the blender, put the cap on, put it on its base, and turned it on. Jeff said he watched that lime pop around in the blender cup, and she poured it in the pint glass, splash, served it to him. He was like, uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, drank it because he asked for it and he paid for it, but I mean, it, there was a little bit lost in translation there. <laughs> you know, they kind of lost the art of making tiki drinks for a while. We were always a tiki bar. It's always been Tonga Hut. Big Mo, he's always been here since 1958. This place was a spot for playing darts, and some of the guys used him for, for darts, which is why his nose is missing right there. But we love him. We take care of him. He's our baby. If we fast forward to 2005, Jeremy purchased the bar, 
and he had some of the local tiki files, some of the people in the community, some of the artists come in and say, man, this is our opportunity. You're young, you're cool, let's do something and bring it back to its former glory. Even though the lamps here look like they're vintage, they're really cool, those were done by Nelson's Tiki Lamps and the velvets were also done by Jason Salin. One of my favorite pieces that we have in here, we have four of them, are these pillars that are holding up the booths. We built the huts over the booths in 2011 and added these vintage tiki's. They came from the Polynesian Village apartment complex that was in Playa del Rey. The apartment complex was built in the 60s, raised in the early 2000s. Someone bought all 200 tiki's that were on the property. We got half of them and half of them went to Max's South Seas, which is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. One of the coolest things about these tiki's and why I love them so much is they're kind of abstract because in the 60s they started reinterpreting traditional designs and making it really an American art form. So little by little they had a couple bartenders who got it and would make tiki drinks on their shifts but you know you still came in on a Saturday night you ordered that gin and tonic or vodka soda because it was more of a three ingredient bar you know that was the kind of bar it was still and they tried to do some events and they had some art shows and then someone brought in the grog log and said here if you want to make some tiki drinks here's a book of tiki cocktails well let's try each and every one of them and hence the loyal order of the drooling bastard was born and welcome to the loyal order of the drooling bastards this is about i don't know Two or three hundred plaques. I believe we have six to eight hundred members. So if you give me your plaque, I'll put it up there. If you don't, no skin off my back because I'm running out of room. <laughs> and what it consists of is having each one of the cocktails in Jeff Berry's, Beach Bum Berry's grog log here at the bar in a year. I don't know, a challenge? I call it cocktail archaeology. So there's all the drinks. You come in, the bartender will mark it off when you've had the cocktail and 12 months, if you've finished it, then you can make one of the plaques and I'll put it up there. The coolest thing is you get a little pendant that allows you to get a buck off your premium cocktails. So forever and ever, for perpetuity, when you come in here, you get a dollar off your drinks. Tonka Tom and Shariaki were the first two. We have a family, Pirate King, Jolly Roger, and June of the Lagoon. It's a father, son, and mom. This guy, King Kong, he finished it in 11 days. I do not recommend this. He probably would have finished it earlier, except he threw up in an Uber twice going home. And then we have one honorary member there up at the top, Dottie. She was a regular here from the day the place opened until the day she passed away in 2011. She was here almost every single day. So has Jeff very done it yet? <laughs> Jeff has not, but Jeff does approve. I got Jeff's thumbs up that he's really stoked that we're doing this because we give him credit. It's become one of the things that we're most famous for. It's a community, it's a family. It's, you can go almost anywhere around the world. If you go to a tiki bar or a tropical cocktail bar, anywhere in the world, somebody's gonna have heard of this or the grog log, or know someone who has done it. So the drooling bastard is our fountain back here. He's usually drooling, he's uh, made of lava, but he's original. one of the original water features here from 58. The fountain didn't work for a couple of decades, but we've got the drooling bastard working. We actually named him the drooling bastard. Because of him, we decided to call our club the loyal order of the drooling bastard, as you could see up there. I came on board here in 2012, and at that time, there was still some of the bartenders who weren't on board with making these cocktails that you had to jigger and measure. And that's where my expertise came in and my passion. And I put out a jigger and I said, everybody's gonna use this. And if you don't wanna use it, you don't have to work here. There's lots of other bars. But at this bar, you're gonna jigger your drinks. I don't care if you jigger a Jack and Coke. You don't have to. You know, that's, that's not the bread and butter. But if you're making a zombie, you have to make a zombie properly. And I want your zombie to taste like this bartender's zombie to taste like my zombie. 
I was a geek my whole life. You know, I was into science in school, which maybe girls weren't into. And I look at some of the cocktails very scientifically when I can, you know, acid and dilution and fattiness. And I try to incorporate that into my drinks without getting too pedantic about it, you know? Because these drinks, bottom line, you want them to taste good but you want them to be balanced. So if it takes knowing about these sort of scientific methods and the proper way of doing things. So in my scholastic sort of way, I studied it and watched and learned and took that and, you know, I could commoditize it to make my living off of it, which is pretty dang lucky. <laughs> Another really special thing that I think we have here is our feature board. So each bartender gets to come up with their own cocktails and feature them on their specials during their shift only. And a lot of beverage directors are too arrogant or maybe too prideful to not live, give their, their team sort of the support that they need to grow. Part of the Tonga Hut's uniqueness is that Hey man, maybe I like this bartender's drinks. Maybe you don't like this bartender's drinks. You're gonna come in and see that bartender not just because of their personality, but their cocktails as well. I think that's pretty special. Another thing that I really very prideful here is that you know we use good ingredients. We use top shelf and as clean and as unadulterated of rums as we possibly can. I've been blessed with judging and being allowed to judge rums in competitions. So, and going to a lot of festivals around the country. So I know the difference between something that's been adulterated and not. So we really try to either let our customers know what they're having or make sure that we have the best juice possible. Juice as in rum. <laughs> juice as in juice as well, because fresh juices are important too. And another cool thing that we do here is we have a monthly rum club. So once a month you can come in and we'll either have a brand or a style or a country or a region and uh, you can try those and I'll make drinks with those and you get to try them neat. One of the ways I like to build drinks is I'll taste the rum and then see where that takes me, you know. So now we're going to make my riff on a classic Don the Beachcomber cocktail, the Italian Zombie. One of the trinity of cocktails is the Zombie. It was created in 1933 by Don Beach, who apparently had, uh, legend hat says that he had a salesman come in who had a hangover, who had a sales meeting he had to get to. So he whipped up this drink with a bunch of rums to cure his hangover, and he said, oh, I walked in there like a zombie, it was great. Trust me, nothing Don did did he whip up. This is a carefully calculated cocktail that is perfectly balanced. He also hit it with a lot of codes, which was his signature thing. It took Jeff Berry 12 years to decode it. So in the meantime, because of the popularity of the zombie, the cocktail spread like wildfire across the US, but nobody actually knew how to make it. So they were just throwing juices into a glass and calling it a zombie. The 1950s era zombie is a little more fruit forward. It has usually apricot brandy and passion fruit in it, where the 30s era zombie is more aromatic with grapefruit, anise, bitters. I've taken the two, combined them, slapped some Italian ingredients in there and call it an Italian zombie. I actually came up with this drink because I was doing a lecture in Italy and I wanted to show how you could take an American cocktail and use local regional ingredients and make it your own. Hence, the Italian zombie. So what I've done for the rums, I take a blend of two different Jamaican rums. Caruba Dark is a classic column still rum from Jamaica doesn't have a lot of the funk, the hogo that you expect from Jamaican rums. So I've taken the Hamilton pot still Jamaican and added half an ounce of that to the Karuba. So we have one and a half Karuba and half of the pot still Hamilton Jamaican. To that, I've taken half an ounce of apricot brandy. And a zombie isn't a zombie with a full load of alcohol in it. 
So we're gonna take and put a full ounce of the Campari. To this, I've taken two ounces of pineapple juice, three quarters of an ounce of fresh lime, half an ounce of passion fruit. So you could see now we're blending the 50s and the 30s together. And Dawn's secret touch, which is six drops of Pernod and two dashes of Angostura bitters. Put some ice in here. Get it on our spindle blender so we get a lot of foam on that cocktail. And voila. We have your Italian zombie. Italian for the Campari and zombie for the amount of alcohol in it. <laughs> Freshen it up with a little mint and voila. Enjoy. We have a solid base here. We have a great following. We have wonderful friends. And thanks to the Grog Log, this community is, is bigger than I think Ace and Edwin ever dreamt. Ace and Edwin Libby ever dreamt that it could have been back in 1958. I've heard from people who knew him that he is proud of what this place has come back to.